Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Carol Greenwood. Thank you very much, and uh, also would love to uh, thank this uh, organization for including me in, uh, in what's just a uh, spectacular event. The, um, I'm going to um, actually start by um, thanking the colleagues in my lab um, so that I don't uh, find that I forget it at the end, as well as my, uh, my funding agencies. The, um, what I'm really wanting to do and argue is uh, to try and make this transition in the fact that my primary interest, and let me just make sure that I've got the, um, yeah, my primary interest is really looking at what we can do to uh, delay um, dementia um, in, uh, in later life. And uh, starting at the point in terms of saying that when we're looking at a youthful perspective, ultimately what we're doing uh, is setting the stage and that we know that the more that we can increase our brain capacity in youth uh, and we come into our um, senior years with higher brain capacity that ultimately what we're doing is we're allowing ourselves to function uh, independently for longer periods of time. So your focus is down here and my focus is all here, but ultimately we're looking at the same biologic processes and we're looking at the same roles. So uh, a piece of this is transferring to uh, your students, but a piece of this is also transferring to yourself. Um, the, um, what I would like to do is just kind of bring a little bit of context in, in terms of making the segue from the talk that we've just heard into, uh, into my arguments, um, is that we, as you were just hearing from Sylvie, when we're looking in terms of the younger ages and what's happening in terms of growth and development of the brain, is that we're born with many more neurons or many more brain cells than we require, and that we go through a period of pruning and effectively making this uh, network. Once we have that network, at that point in time, we're actually looking at what can we do to maintain the number of cells that we can do, that we can have, and that any kind of growth that we see beyond that is going to see beneficially. Um, so I'm going to be talking about some of the same measures that Sylvie was talking about, and while she was talking about it developmentally in terms of saying that this pruning and clipping and all of those types of things are helping us establish the networks that we need, I'm going to be talking talking about the same, net, the same issues in terms of um, sort of those connections and maintaining those brain cells, but now we're going to be talking about it from a positive perspective. Um, so we're kind of making a, an age shift where we're using identical measures, um, but we're going to be interpreting them from a different perspective because we're at different points of the developmental, um, uh, the developmental trajectory. And where it comes in particularly is I think that what kind of informs the research as we're uh, talking about the potential role of nutrition is that once we're sort of beyond this original developmental setup, that ultimately as we're looking in terms of learning and developing new cognitive skills, that we have two fundamental processes that we're really wanting to encourage, that one now is that we're actually wanting birth of new neurons, um, and that of the neurons that are there, we're wanting to strengthen those connections, and that we strengthen those connections at a synaptic level. So we're effectively wanting to support those two biologic processes, and that I would argue that when you start to look at where the role of nutrition is coming in, that the nutrition is not providing the stimulus in terms of um, enabling those connections to be made, but what it is doing very importantly is it's providing the environment to allow that to happen. Um, so that we've talked about stimuluses in terms of um, how children can learn. We've taught, you know, we'll be hearing about other, uh, other stimuli throughout the course of the day. But looking in terms of saying if you focus on reasoning skills in children, that you can see improvements across a whole bunch of different domains. And that if I was measuring that at a biologic level, um, what we would be seeing is growth of new neurons um, in, in older individuals and improvement in terms of those synaptic connections. That is not going to happen if you don't have the right chemical environment around the neuron in order to be able to support those things happening. And that's where I would argue that we see the important role in terms of, uh, in terms of nutrition. Our perspective of looking at it is in terms of can we prevent or delay uh, the onset of dementia, uh, and particularly in terms of Alzheimer's dementias, but we're also looking in that role in terms of what we call vascular dementias, which is a dementia that's more associated with 
um, uh, well, aging of the, uh, of the brain vasculature. The good news is that we think that at least 30% of dementia diagnoses um, are attributable to lifestyle factors that we could modify. Um, and that in a recent uh, paper, where uh, very recent, they were looking at, well, what would happen if we took sort of the, uh, what they call the seven attributable risk factors, which include things like diabetes, high blood pressure, obesity, uh, poor, physical uh, poor physical activity, depression, smoking, and low educational attainment. Um, and if we could sort of work at a population societal level, that if we could reduce the prevalence of that by as little as 10%, so we're really talking about a very small reduction, that we would actually, that that would translate into at least an 8% reduction of dementias and that if we could be a little bit more successful and reduce it by 20%, that that would actually translate into a 15% reduction in dementia. So when we start to look in terms of um, are there small things that we can do uh, in youth and adolescence and early adulthood that ultimately would be decreasing the likelihood um, that we would be going on to develop dementia? What I'm going to argue is yes, and you're going to hear from me in terms of nutrition. We're going to hear later in terms of physical activity and the sort of that composite role in terms of lifestyle as it supports uh, the functioning of the brain through, uh, throughout our lifespan. This is the major problem that we're battling. Um, and that you can imagine, as I was talking in terms of saying, what are the major lifestyle contributions associated with dementias? Um, I'm telling you that it's diabetes, it's high blood pressure, and it's elevated blood lipids or elevated cholesterol. And we all know that those are obesity-associated disorders. Um, so that when we start to look in terms of what's happening in our population, particularly the increased prevalence of obesity, what that could potentially mean in terms of the burden of dementia farther down the road is actually a very sobering thought because um, when we look in terms of uh, my being part of the baby boomer generation, we are bringing more bad health to our senior years than my parents did, and that we know that that increasing burden of poor health um, is actually escalating in our population. Um, so we do have a problem um, that doesn't bode well as it, um, as it relates to um, sort of our future cognitive health. And usually when I'm speaking, I'm talking to, you know, sort of people in mid middle adulthood, and I'm trying to get across the concept that when we start to look at retirement planning, that most of us are looking at it from a financial perspective, and we fail to look at it from a health perspective. Um, and that what I'm really trying to encourage people to do is that as you're looking at your financial planning for your retirement, that really what you want to be doing is setting yourself up that that money's paying for your green fee at a golf course and not for long-term care. Um, and so the earlier you start to think about that, the more important it is. And actually having the opportunity to talk to educators where we can be starting this earlier and earlier in the lifespan of an individual is just such a wonderful opportunity for me. There's no question when we start to look at what are some of our problems as it relates to obesity and um, chronic disorders of obesity that it's not going to surprise you that we have reams and reams of evidence. Um, sort of that traditional North American diet that we've been brought up in is bad for our brains. Um, the, um, and here is really a very, uh, and it's an intentionally a complex picture. Uh, I'm not going to go through the details of it, um, but it's really our model of my brain on diabetes. <clears throat> the, um, and that the message that I'm trying, whoops, went in the wrong direction here. Um, like Sylvia, I've been hitting the wrong, um, let me get back here. The message that I'm really wanting to get across here is that 
there are a host of different things that are going wrong in the brain when we bring those obesity associated disorders to play. Um, and that really needs to inform us as we start to look at what's the optimal nutrition environment. Um, because what I'm saying is that there's a vast array of things. Many of them are related to the fact that our blood vessels are being damaged by these disorders. Others relate to sort of a metabolic environment that we're setting up that is not going to promote the development of those new synaptic connections, but it's also t saying that given the complexity, a single nutrient is not the solution. Um, we have way too many problems here, and we have way too much media trying to advocate the use of single nutrients, um, and that what I'm saying is that that is really a very myoptic view in terms of what the problems are, and that we have to be much broader in our perspective, and we have to recognize that we have a complex array of things that are going wrong. Whoops, so let me get myself back on track here. It has not been politically comfortable um, to make the arguments that these obesity-associated disorders may be harmful to children, um, and, so, and particularly as it relates to their school performance. I have to applaud uh, a colleague in our field, uh, Tony Convit, for stepping forward um, and really putting himself in the position where um, he uh, is vulnerable to attack. Um, we are all very concerned in terms of the adverse role of obesity as it relates to brain health. Um, and that uh, in a f sort of series of recent papers by Tony, he's really been looking at the negative effect of the presence of obesity as it relates to school performance in children. Um, and so in terms of looking at, um, at a, a more recent paper that, uh, that he was published, is he was looking at adolescents and whether or not adolescents had something called the metabolic syndrome. Um, and the metabolic syndrome is a term that we use for uh, individuals that have um, a composite number of these adverse uh, uh, adverse metabolic disorders. So uh, it's across uh, obesity, increased waist circumference, elevated blood pressure, elevated cholesterol. And in order to be uh, diagnosed with the metabolic syndrome, you have to be carrying at least three of these. Um, so we call it, call, call it um, the toxic cafe, um, that you have multiple poor disorders. And so as we're starting to see increased prevalence of obesity in our children and in our adolescents, it's not surprising to be arguing that we're seeing increased numbers of young children that actually are diagnosed with this metabolic syndrome. Um, and certainly when we start to look in terms of um, children at the age of six being diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. Um, I mean, it is horrific in terms of, I'm going to argue what it's doing to them right now as it relates to Tony's uh, data, but given that my interest is, is how this projects long-term health, um, that the more we're going into the long-term health and the longer the brain is uh, exposed to these negative insults, the poorer that projection is going to be or that trajectory is going to be for the child. So when you look in terms of some of the data that uh, Tony was looking at as he was comparing adolescents that did and did not have the metabolic syndrome, and that you can see that if you look in terms of the children with the metabolic syndrome, that they were actually doing significantly worse in standardized scores in terms of spelling and arithmetic. Um, so that just the presence of these obesity-associated disorders was associating with, uh, with poor uh, performance on the scores. And then he went on to look at measures in terms of the brain. And what was happening is that the children with the metabolic syndrome, uh, and particularly this is a score of insulin resistance, that the greater the insulin resistance in the individual, um, the uh, the smaller the size of the hippocampus, so that when we're starting to talk in terms of uh, meaningful brain regions as it supports cognitive function, that the hippocampus is playing a, a very key role in terms of, of memories, and that in this particular instance, unlike what we heard before, because we're in adolescence, because we've already done all of the pruning, um, and we're into a period where we want to maintain and grow the hippocampus, when we're starting to see atrophy or small, uh, getting smaller of that hippocampus, 
campus, it's a very negative outcome. Um, and it's also accompanied by uh, increases in terms of the um, ventricle sizes, so the spaces in the brain. So what we're seeing is that while we knew that uh, if you looked in the context of adult diabetes, that there was evidence that the brains of individuals um, <clears throat> were experiencing atrophy, the brains were getting smaller, and that the fact that this is now translating into adolescence I think is particularly sobering. We've been interested in sort of the role of these metabolic disorders more as it relates to um, uh, maintaining cognitive health in, uh, in older individuals and also interested in terms of um, that <clears throat> pus cafe of metabolic disorders. And while our focus has generally been in looking at older adults with type 2 diabetes, that we know that the individual with diabetes generally has, a, has the metabolic syndrome uh, factors as well. Most individuals with diabetes are also, also have elevated blood pressure. They also have elevated cholesterol. And it really has been trying to figure out um, because we know that diabetes itself uh, increases the likelihood of dementia, it increases the likelihood that we're going to have premature cognitive decline. Um, is it diabetes or is it blood pressure um, that's really causing the harm? And we've been sort of trying to tease those two uh, issues out using some of the similar uh, MRI techniques that, uh, that we've already heard about. And so in this particular um, piece, what we were really trying to understand is, is it high blood pressure or is it diabetes or is it the combination that seems to be most important? And this data is really arguing that it's the combination. So we're comparing older adults that have high blood pressure with older adults that have high blood pressure and diabetes to try and tease out that specific part in terms of the diabetes. And what we are looking at um, are two different types of measures. So one is cortical thinning. Um, and and that we've heard that in youth, as we're pruning, cortical thinning is good. Um, we're now talking about in older age, we're, we're trying to maintain brain size and cortical thinning is bad. Um, and that what we can see is that there are areas where the individuals with the combination of uh, high blood pressure and diabetes are experiencing more cortical thinning than individuals that don't have it. Um, we're also looking in terms of measures of blood flow um, so that you can imagine the analogy here is that as we're using, as we're, we know that as in individuals are engaging in cognitive tasks, um, ultimately what's happening is that those neurons are sending signals to our blood vessels to say dilate, I'm working hard, bring me more glucose, bring me more fuel, bring me more oxygen. And so what we're measuring actually on functional MRI is looking at sort of those differences in terms of blood flow to different brain regions while we're performing those tasks. It's a fundamental measure of what we're doing. But if you're in a situation where your blood vessels are getting uh, atherosclerotic, so they're stiffer, they may not be getting those signals from the neurons in terms of being able to have that vasodilation, that you're going to have these neurons that are working very hard and they're going to get no relief. Um, they're not going to get the glucose. They're not going to get the, uh, um, the oxygen that they, uh, that they require. And this is what we call vasoreact... Uh, <coughs> cerebrovascular reactivity is that ability to locally in, uh, dilate um, different vessels in different brain regions in order to make sure that whoever's working the hardest is getting the most oxygen and the most glucose. Um, and that what it is arguing here in this context is that when we look in terms of individuals with high blood pressure and high blood pressure and type 2 diabetes, that that loss of the ability um, for the blood vessels to expand and um, sort of redirect uh, in order to be able to accommodate needs as we change our cognitive processing becomes compromised. Um, and that we're arguing that over time, uh, as we can't feed neurons when they're actively working, that that's going to be contributing to their death and that that's why we're getting the cortical thinning. Um, so that we have sort of this progressive uh, series of events that are occurring in the context of these metabolic disorders. And we've been looking in terms of whether or not that's um, predictive at all in terms of uh, declining cognitive function, and this is actually saying that it is. Um, that if you look in terms of 
uh, associations between these measures of cortical thinning and ability to perform an executive function task and actually the task that we're using is one that relies on working memory that we were talking about before and that for individuals that are experiencing the cortical thinning they are doing poorer on these cognitive tasks. Um, so we would argue that these structural processes and vascular processes that are occurring in the brain are negative in terms of our ability to sustain our cognitive health with age and that the bad news is that we're now having to ask about this in the context of youth and adolescence um, and the degree to which their brain function is being compromised by exactly the, uh, the same processes. So that's kind of my glass half empty um, part of the, um, of the story. So are we able to kind of turn this into a more positive outlook and particularly a more positive outlook before we go to coffee break? Um, I always seem to, um, <laughs> to be put just before we're tempted with cookies and, uh, and other things. So the answer is, can we put it into a more positive perspective? And, and it really is that we can. Um, that we hear a lot in terms of the Mediterranean diet, um, particularly as it relates to heart health. And the overall mantra from a nutrition perspective is that what's good for the heart is good for the brain, and that particularly carries through as we look in terms of um, sort of nutritional associates uh, associations between um, optimal nutrition and all optimal cognitive health. <clears throat> there have been a number of studies that have been going on in terms of the role of the Mediterranean diet um, and they're now at the point where we're kind of being able to look at composites across a whole bunch of different studies occurring both in North America and Europe and that if we look in terms of people that are eating what we call this Mediterranean style diet um, that they have less likelihood of being diagnosed with something that we call mild cognitive impairment and this is just really the the pre-dementia phase, so the same way that we talk about people being pre-diabetic, um, they're on the road to diabetes, but they haven't yet hit the hallmarks of it. We can talk about the same thing in terms of dementia. Somebody that's uh, being diagnosed as being uh, mild cognitive impairment hasn't quite hit the hallmarks of dementia, but we know they're on that trajectory. Um, and so the higher the, the higher the quality of the diet, 27% less likelihood um, that you'll be diagnosed with um, uh, with mild cognitive impairment and 36% less likely that you would actually be diagnosed with dementia. Um, so when we look in terms of uh, the magnitude of the benefits associated with higher quality eating, um, that they are actually very large in size. Um, and the important piece that I always argue about this is that we now know that this translates across into North America um, and that there have been a number of studies now that are looking at um, older adults that are aging either in downtown New York City or downtown Chicago. Um, so we're not talking about the benefits of living on a Mediterranean Isle and the peacefulness of the life. Um, we're talking about the realities of um, being from lower socioeconomic groups in urban centers in North America. Um, so this is something that definitely does translate into, uh, into a North American context. Whoops. And I'll just go back here quickly because people People often ask in terms of <clears throat> what is the Mediterranean diet um, and that when we look in terms of the pyramid that it's going we can see that it's a diet that's really grounded in terms of uh, whole grains fruits and vegetables uh, a tremendous reliance in terms of uh, fish in terms of one of the staples in terms of the uh, the diet uh, and that when we look at red meats, um, that while it's not a diet where you abstain from red meat, it, red meat is the treat. Um, that, you know, it's sort of arguing that you're having it once a month, certainly not once a day, and certainly not three times a day. Um, so you don't need to abstain, but you need to be transitioning so that you're using the red meat as um, sort of the treat. Um, and as people look at this, <clears throat> they're kind of often saying, oh my goodness, how am I going to do that? Um, and the easiest way that you're going to do that is that red wine is actually part of the diet so that um, you can treat yourself to the red wine um, while you're having your, uh, your fish for your, uh, for your main protein. The, um, so there's always good news. It's always half full. Um, and, the, uh, and I like to keep my wine glass absolutely full. The... Um, <laughs> 
I think what's happened is that as we start to understand in terms of what are the real benefits that we see in, in terms of people that are eating higher quality diets to the, these kind of measures in terms of sustaining brain function, um, that we have a whole host of understanding of the factors that are actually going on. Um, that as we're saying, it seems to be slowing down this degree of atrophy that we see as a standard part of the, um, of the aging process. Um, that we're less likely to have what we call white matter hyperintensities. And these are effectively things that we see when we're looking at structural neuroimaging. And they're called white matter hyperintensities because they're showing as small little white spots as we're looking at the scans. And what those really are are pinholes in your brain. Um, and I can tell you that the more you have high blood pressure and the more you're not controlling your blood pressure, what's happening over time is you're getting breaks in the capillaries, sort of the small parts of the blood vessels that are going to be most susceptible to that high blood pressure. And we're going to see it as tiny little holes. Um, and what's going to happen is that those tiny little holes start to accumulate over time, that that's going to compromise your cognitive function because the connections that Sylvie was talking about before are becoming compromised because we're breaking making those connections. Um, and if we look in terms of the types of cognitive processes that are going to be impacted, it's going to come back to the argument of location, location, location. Um, so depending on where those white matter hyperintensities are developing your brain, you're breaking those connections, that the types of cognitive processes that are dependent on those connections are the ones that are going to be compromised. Um, we know that in general they tend to have ones that ultimately are connecting up to the, uh, up to the front frontal lobe, but the more of these intensities people have, the poorer their cognitive function is we're starting to measure. And you can probably understand that it's also telling us that they're going to be at very high risk for strokes um, because we're already seeing that their high blood pressure is impacting the brain and it's really just a ticking time bomb in terms of uh, individuals going on in terms of having uh, having that full full blown strokes. The um, other thing that we know that is happening in the context of the, um, of the improvement in terms of diet quality is that we're seeing lower indications of inflammation. Um, and that the same way that we talk in terms of um, inflammatory processes underlying a number of diseases of what I call south of the neck, um, that inflammation is equally as important north of the neck and the more that we can moderate the inflammation, the better off we're, uh, we're going to be. So we have a good understanding. We also have a good understanding that we're not talking about a single nutrient here. We're talking about a complex diet that's bringing us complex benefits in terms of supporting overall brain function. The Mediterranean diet has started to been talked about in terms of the Holy Grail. Um, and I think that it's not appropriate. Is there evidence that it's the Holy Grail? And the answer to that is absolutely not. Um, that we can model a healthy diet in a number of different ways um, and that ultimately what we're talking about um, is a diet that's high in fruits and vegetables, grains and cereals, beans, pulses, things like lentils, um, fish, uh, low in those saturated fats and highly processed foods, and that there's a number of different ways that we can actually achieve that. Um, and the reason that I think that that's important is that somehow or another people have um, heard about the Mediterranean diet and they're thinking, oh, I've got to eat Greek and Italian. Um, and that's not really what we're trying to tell you. We're trying to tell you, you got to eat more fruits and vegetables. Um, and we can also do that by embracing other people's cultures. Um, and so trying to take the moniker of the Mediterranean diet out of here in terms of our understanding of what's health I think is important because it opens us to embracing culture um, and that it allows us to, uh, you know, kind of explore across a whole bunch of different tastes and textures. Um, and that here is just some data that we have from a group of older adults that we've been studying, that we've been um, uh, monitoring in living in, uh, in Quebec. And what it's arguing is that those individuals that are eating a healthier diet um, are actually declining less over time in um, sort of a global composite measure of cognitive function relative to those individuals that aren't eating a healthy diet. And in this particular instance, our definition of healthy diet was how, how well did you meet Canada's food guide? 
Um, so we can use a number of different measures of health um, in terms of what are the types of dietary ingredients that we want to uh, we want to consume, um, but we're all coming back to the same. And so it's how do we kind of get that? And I'll get to that second. Keep to that more simple message. Um, and that it's also now trying to go back in terms of saying, I'm really interested in what's going to happen to my brain health, quite frankly, when I'm 80, because I want to be on the golf course. Um, and what do I need to do and what do I need to focus on to make sure that there's increased likelihood that that's what I'm going to be doing. And here's coming back in terms of saying it's at least by the time we're in mid-adulthood that we need to make those, um, those changes. Um, and that arguing that knowing your health status in your 50s is going to give me more information in terms of your dementia risk in your 70s than knowing your health status in your 70s. Um, so we need to be communicating, I think, most assertively to individuals that are sort of in that what used to be called empty nesting um, and now is called the sandwich generation, um, the, um, that that's the period of time that we really need to be optimizing our health as it relates to neuroprotection with aging. Um, and that it's also then, I think, taking individuals like yourselves and trying to make the argument that it's never too early to make these changes. Um, we're starting to talk about uh, diet, lifestyle associated disorders, that the longer we're going to have them, the longer the brain is having these insults, the more we're going to be compromising the function. And that I think it's also then trying to pull it back in terms of what do I need to do in order to be able to stimulate brain growth um, and enable the types of learning processes that you're wanting to do as educators and coming back to that fundamental argument that if you have a brain that's inflamed, if you have a brain where we can't open blood vessels and get those blood vessels to the areas that we're trying to improve, that your likelihood of success is going to be less. Um, that we need to take care of the metabolic health of the brain in order to put it in a position where it's going to be able to respond to the types of uh, stimuli that we're wanting to, uh, we're wanting to impose. And this is just really arguing that, you know, the nice thing that we've learned throughout my courses um, in, in science is that the brain has this capacity to continue to improve throughout life. Um, when I was an undergraduate many years ago, um, I mean, it was kind of, it was all uninteresting after the time we had, you know, reached the age of 20, the brain was already developed, there was nothing we could do, and we now know that we couldn't be more wrong. Um, that we have this capacity to continue to add new brain cells, to make new connections, and that this occurs throughout our lifespan. And this is just a, uh, a slide from a study that was, whoops, done in, um, in Spain, where they had individuals who already had um, risk factors for cardiovascular disease, so they were already hypertensive, they already had the high cholesterol, and saying if we took those individuals and put them onto a Mediterranean style, a healthier diet, that while they were predominantly interested in terms of cardiovascular events, that their data were suggesting um, that you could actually see improvements in terms of cognitive function. And what I think is particularly stunning in this is that they were specifically looking at a group of people that were already 75 years of age. Um, and so we see improvements even in older adults as we improve the diet. Um, and then the piece that I like to make coming from Ontario is that uh, one of the areas where they saw improvements is something that we call the clock drawing test, um, and that test now is actually core to um, retaining your driver's license in Ontario. Um, so you want to maintain your independence uh, and keep your driver's license, you got to learn how to do the clock drawing test, and I'm telling you, you eat better, you're going to do better on the clock drawing test. Um, so if that doesn't motivate you to make some of those changes, um, I'm not certain what, uh, what else will. We have that in terms of a lot of misinformation um, being available um, and that it makes it very difficult in terms of well-meaning people, I think, trying to understand what it should be doing in terms of trying to optimize their diet in terms of supporting brain health. So I want to just address a couple of different things. Um, we hear a lot in terms of individual supplements, individual nutrients, um, and I think it's really coming out of the scientific process where we may understand that a, you know, sort of a complex array of foods seem to be associated with better brain performance. Um, 
we want to understand that and we often do that in terms of trying to look at isolated components of the foods in order to be able to get a conceptual understanding of why these foods are so beneficial. But we've sort of gone from a period now that once we go through this process, rather than using that information to inform public health pro policy and, you know, sort of focus in terms of trying to say, okay, we've really got to get more fruits and vegetables into Canadians, um, that what we're doing is we're either taking those isolated compounds and we're now marketing them in, in pill format, um, or even worse, that we're adding them to less than optimal foods. Um, and nobody is going to convince me that adding essence of broccoli um, to this particular <laughs> lunch is going to make it a healthy meal, but somehow or another we want to believe that, don't we? Um, the, um, and that if we go back then in terms of trying to say, this is my brain on diabetes, um, that you can imagine that by trying to, to pinpoint and just fix one of those little complex arrays with a pill is not going to be my answer. Um, and that as a consequence of that, it's not surprising that we have no evidence from clinical trials that any single supplement, any single food is going to have a benefit. It's also become very trendy to try and refer to foods as superfoods. Um, and so, and there are certainly people that are arguing that there are superfoods from, brain, from a brain health perspective. And I would say, is there any evidence to that? And I would say there's absolutely no evidence whatsoever. Um, so that when we look in terms of how we study um, the connection between diet and brain health, that we generally have composite measures. Um, so we know, for instance, that consuming more vegetables vegetables is good. We do know that consuming more of, let's say, the, what we call a cruciferous vegetables, things like cauliflower and broccolis and all of those types of things also seems to be good, but we can't really tease that down to a single food. We don't have the uh, ability to discriminate, yet we have a lot of people trying to promote single foods in terms of being the superfoods and just to here to say we don't have the evidence um, and that we're actually even getting worse now where we're starting to get people sort of saying eating single foods actually is causing dementia and we equally don't have any uh, evidence on that. So I've kind of come up with my own operating definition of what I consider a superfood um, and it's actually the fruit or vegetable that you'll eat. Um, and that <laughs> it's no use going out and buying the kale and putting it in your fridge and throwing it into the trash can at the end of the week because actually you don't like kale. Um, that we really have to start focusing in terms of what are the fruits and vegetables that people will eat. And I think as we're starting to look in terms of school programs and supporting school programs for, um, for children, that what do we need to do in order to be able to increase their consumption of fruits and vegetables and how do we rely on the familiar fruits and vegetables that they're more likely to include in their diet rather than trying to give them uh, foods that, they, uh, that they're not particularly interested in. The other problem that we have really comes into the marketing trends, so that whether we're looking in terms of um, sort of the traditional multinationals or uh, companies that are you know, sort of not naturally associated with being multinationals, but talking in terms of the health benefits of their food, that we're developing into a mismatch of where we have health-related information on foods um, relative to what we consider what are healthy foods. Um, so here's a study that was done from a colleague of mine at University of Toronto, where they were actually looking at what type of foods whoops, carry nutrition-related information Whoops, let me go back here, sorry. Um, and that when you looked in terms of the vast array of health-related information, whether it was low calorie, whether it was low sodium, whether it had you know, more antioxidants or whatever, that 41% of the foods that were carrying this information is foods that Canada Health Guide, Canada's Food Guide is telling you not to eat. So why are we putting health information on foods that we should be minimizing in our diet? Um, and we all fundamentally know as you go down that aisle of potato chips and tacos and all of that kind of stuff, that while you can have them as treats, these are, shouldn't be staples in your diet. Um, and you're fooling yourself if you're choosing the one that has the probiotic in it. Um, you know, why not eat the yogurt? Um, and so we have a lot of mismatch in terms of health-related information on foods. And you go down that aisle that has the canned beans and the lentils and the grains and all of that kind of stuff, not a food message to be seen. 
Um, so we have these aisles and aisles and aisles of healthy foods, and we have no health-related information on those. Um, and then we have these aisles and aisles and aisles of foods that we know we really shouldn't be eating very often, and we're inundated with health messaging. So we have a really bad mismatch in terms of what we would like the um, the you know the consumer to know and how we're providing them the information and somehow or another we have to figure out how to return to the simple message because it's a simple message that's the most important um, that what you really need to do as it relates to brain health and I'm going to argue brain health you know from birth through to um, uh, through to old age is managing our body weight so that we're managing our cholesterol and our blood pressure and we're decreasing the likelihood that we're developing diabetes because we know that these are the factors that are going to contribute to negative cognitive performance. Um, and we do that by eating fruits and vegetables. We don't have to worry about whether it's kale or blueberries or red peppers. We just want to put more fruit and vegetable on our plates. Um, we also need to make certain that we're going more complex in terms of our grains and carbohydrates, um, that we're bringing more fish into our diet, and that if you're not able to be eating fish, then you really do need to be looking at where else you're getting your omega-3 fatty acids from, because they are important in terms of brain function and they're also important in terms of helping lowering that inflammation that we have in the brain. And then we know that those, you know, sort of convenience foods that are around, they're both high in sodium, they're low in some of these other nutrients. Well, I'm going to say you should, you don't have to worry about abstaining from them entirely. They shouldn't form a staple in your diet. And I think what we're seeing is development now that's going on in the U.S. and Canada in terms of trying to help um, the consumers understand this a little bit easier because we know that by trying to say, um, you know, you have to have so many servings of fruits and vegetables a day, it doesn't work. Um, you know, people will come to me and they'll have a banana and they'll say, is that one serving of fruits and veg or one serving of fruit? And I'll say, yes, it is a serving of fruit. And then they'll come to me with a bigger banana and they'll say, and how many servings of fruit is that? And I'll say, it's one. Um, so we know that it's very difficult to operationalize that. And I think that this is a much better depiction in terms of what it's saying is as you sit down, I'm going to I sort of jokingly say your plate should be half green, and what I'm meaning from that is that your plate should be half fruits and vegetables. Um, and that the more we can get people to sort of think in that con that a way of, as I sit down, I really make need to make certain that I have a lot of plant food on the on my plate. I can still have my meat, I can still have my fish, but we have to make sure that we're moving more in terms of putting plant food on our uh, on our plates. I'd like to contextualize this, and I have 15 minutes more, sorry, um, a little bit by arguing that while you know I'm going to be here and I'm going to advocate in terms of the benefits of a healthy diet, that I think it's really important that as we start to look in terms of what do I need to do to support brain health, both in terms of our youth and, and in terms of ourselves as we're aging, that we really need to put lifestyle context um, to it because I will argue that if you have a bad lifestyle just correcting one piece of it is not going to be sufficient. Um, so from a nutrition analogy I would say that um, if you come to me and you're vitamin C deficient um, that that's really telling me that you're not eating enough fruits and vegetables if you don't have enough vitamin C and I'm not going to try to correct that by giving you a vitamin C tablet because I'm not giving you all of the other nutrients that are normally in fruits and vegetables, if I try to do it that way, that I'm far better to sort of say, vitamin C, now you've got to go home and start eating fruits and vegetables, and that trying to sort of have that more context in terms of what I'm trying to um, overcome is the better way to do it, and we need to think of this way in terms of supporting cognitive health. This is the problem that we have. We know that um, most individuals, as they're sitting and watching the television, is that they're eating salty fruits and, uh, and snacks, and so that we have a combination of problems that are actually going on. And we became very interested in terms of that interaction between, you know, sort of normal levels of physical activity um, and attributes of the diet in this group of individuals that we're looking in Quebec. And here's just an example where we were particularly interested in sodium intake and sort of from that argument that the higher our intakes of sodium, the more likely it is that we're going to have elevated blood pressure. I've told you that blood pressure is bad, and so am I still going to see a relationship when I start to look at older adults living in the community in terms of their sodium intake? And the answer became yes, but. 
Um, and the yes but was depending on how physically active they were. Um, so that if we look in terms of this panel where um, people were normally engaging in physical activity, they could eat as much sodium as they wanted. Um, but if we looked at people that were physically inactive, the ones that were declining much more extensively were the individuals that um, had a combination, and these are reverse scales, but combinations of high sodium intake and low levels of physical activity. Um, and I think if you want to rationalize it, that what we're saying is that very one of the things that we really need to do is maintain the health of our blood vessels, and that if you're exercising re regularly, you're already having input in terms of supporting that and you may be able to get away with a little bit of sodium in your diet um, but give me the combination of high sodium and low physical activity and you've really got problems in terms of your um, blood vessels in your brain so the solution here is not to tell people only to stop eating those high sodium foods the solution is stop eating those high sodium foods and get off your butt um, because it's going to be the combination of those two that are going to be most important um, and the um, and here I think is a very sobering one as it relates in terms of education um, and uh, and diet so we know that when we look in terms of what are some of the strongest predictors in terms of our brain health um, in our senior years one of the strongest predictors is our educational attainment in youth um, and that probably is having huge impacts from a number of different ways so one is you know in that youth we're building this brain capacity um, because we're getting more education um, the and I like to put that into an analogy um, very similar to osteoporosis um, so we're if we're looking um, for women in terms of what do we do to prevent hip fracture in old life, uh, old age, um, that what we're wanting to do when we're in our adolescence and our youth is making certain that we're exercising and have lots of calcium so that we're building as dense bone as possible. And then when we get into the postmenopausal years, we're wanting to do everything we can do to maintain what bone strength we've ever we've been able to build through our lifespan. The brain works exactly the same way. Um, what we're wanting to do is build as much capacity as we can in youth. Um, we then go in that in general, people that have higher levels of education go on to more complex occupations. And as a consequence, they're continuing to get that stimulation throughout their adult life. So that by the time they reach their retirement years, they have this excess capacity in terms of their cognitive function. And those are gonna be the people that are gonna be less likely to go on to develop dementias. Um, so that what we have, and you can see here in terms of looking at our, whoops, keep doing that, um, our Quebec population, is that groups of individuals that had higher levels of education Look at how much better they're scoring on a uh, sort of a general cognitive um, test relative to those individuals that didn't achieve the same level of education. This is what you're setting up for in our youth. Um, you're setting up our youth by stimulating them cognitively so that they have good cognitive function as they age. But look at the negative in terms of taking those youth that have poor education attainment in the context of a poor quality diet, um, that it is those people that are particularly vulnerable um, in terms of having a combination of negative inputs as it relates to their cognitive function um, so that you escalate the deficit if you're um, you know, sort of minimizing across. And so that's where I'm saying I think we really have to start to look at what we're doing and that's what's the lovely um, nature of today is that we have a complex different numbers of expertise and ultimately looking at how do we integrate it um, in order to maximize the cognitive health of our youth. I'm just going to end very quickly in terms of talking a little bit in terms of tricks throughout the day that we can um, be looking at in terms of, uh, of cognition. And a lot of this work sort of gets grounded back to some um, seminal work that was done by Paul Gold and his colleagues um, starting actually many years ago now where it was recognizing the fact that as we um, uh, enter into any kind of cognitive process, that the primary fuel that the brain is using or that those nerve cells that are engaged at that point is glucose. Um, and so what would happen if I made certain that I had more glucose on board as people were starting to perform a cognitive task and what I see benefits in terms of their cognitive performance? So that was the backdrop of the um, 
of the question that was being asked and some early work of Paul's where it was arguing that yes, you can actually boost performance um, by having somebody consume a glucose drink before you have them take a cognitive task rather than having them do it um, under fasting conditions. Um, and that we would actually see a larger gain in older individuals than we would in youth. Um, and that I think that this has informed our thoughts around this process for a number of different years. And probably the only uh, issue that I would have had for uh, Paul's study is where he was using his cutoff in terms of a senior. Um, <laughs> And I think that it's really told you in terms of how much we've really changed our attitudes towards, um, um, you know, sort of um, uh, 60 being the, the new 40, I think it is, or is it the other way around, um, that, the, um, that we are expecting our, uh, to have health and have cognitive health for longer periods of time. This type of work has actually moved forward in a number of different ways um, as, um, you know, sort of in the intervening period of time. Um, and that one of the journeys that we've taken really um, has been trying to look in terms of arguing that ultimately what we're doing in a lot of these studies is really modeling breakfast. Um, because what we have um, our individuals do is that they come to us fasting first thing in the morning. We either test them right away while they're still fasting or we give them something to eat and then we test them and that's breakfast. Um, and so that as you're looking in terms of um, older adults and you're putting them under those testing paradigms, that what you're seeing is that they're performing cognitively better after you've provided them some sort of breakfast. Um, and we've looked at it in generally, well, you know, using cereals, using um, sources of, of glucose, so sources of healthy carbohydrates, um, juices, half bagels, all of that type of thing. And then we became very interested in terms of saying, well, what happens if somebody has diabetes? Um, because we know that individuals with diabetes don't handle glucose well. Um, and so can we still actually give somebody with diabetes glucose and see um, whether or not they're going to improve their cognitive function? And the early answer to that was no. Um, that if you had diabetes, um, that actually, and here we're looking at how many words um, people remember, that if you give them food, and in this particular um, study it was a small thing of juice and a half a bagel, that they actually did worse um, after they consumed the glucose um, or the carbohydrate food than if they hadn't consumed anything at all. And so it then was sort of trying to go on to a journey in terms of saying, what can I do for somebody with diabetes that's going to help them optimize their brain function knowing that they're going to have problems if I'm going to elevate their blood glucose levels? And so we started to look more in terms of the complexity of that carbohydrate. Um, and one way that we define complexity is something that we call the high glycemic index. Um, it's probably a term that you've heard in the media. Um, and that here's an example. So um, this is um, what happens to our blood glucose if we're fasting. It doesn't change at all. The two foods that we were comparing here were um, white bread and pasta. Um, the, uh, and the reason that we chose that is white bread is something that's called a high glycemic index food. And you can see that your blood glucose goes up quite sharply and quite rapidly after you've eaten um, white bread and that you're sustaining those levels for longer periods of time. If you eat a more complex carbohydrate um, or a lower glycemic index carbohydrate, and in this instance we use pasta, um, pasta has been... Um, uh, and this is just simple white pasta. For some reason, the public thinks that pasta is high glycemic index, and it is not. It's a low glycemic index carbohydrate. You can go home and have that spaghetti for dinner and feel good about it. Um, the, um, that what happens on these lower glycemic index carbohydrate foods is that we absorb them more slowly, and consequently, we get less of a rise in blood glucose, and it starts to actually decline a little bit faster. And this is not even happening within individuals with diabetes. Diabetes. So one of the ways that we can modulate just how high your blood glucose levels go after you consume a meal is through changing the complexity of, uh, of the carbohydrates that you're consuming. And indeed, when you start looking at that, then we don't get the negative part of 
carbohydrate consumption in individuals with, um, uh, with type 2 diabetes. And indeed, sorry, this is a, a little all scrunched up in here, that what it was showing is that if you gave those individuals white bread, that high glycemic index carbohydrate, we still interfered with their cognitive performance. But if we gave them a more complex carbohydrate to consume, actually, that we didn't have that interference. Um, so there were ways that you could even, in the context of diabetes, modulate um, sort of the glucose supply going to the brain, which actually wasn't going to compromise their brain function. Um, so it was telling us that we could start looking at designing diets that would be beneficial uh, across the board because we knew that in healthy individuals it didn't matter if they consumed the high or the low glycemic index carbohydrates that both of those were actually benefiting the individuals cognitively but what it meant is that if we concentrated more on the low glycemic index carbohydrates that we were also not interfering with the cognitive abilities of individuals with diabetes um, you can imagine that a lot of this type of work ultimately has gone down in terms of trying to look at um, breakfast programs um, in schools, and there have been recently two what we call systematic reviews, so people that are looking at the composite of, um, of data across a large number of studies, both of which are ultimately supporting um, breakfast programs in, uh, in children as it relates to academic performance. And I'll tell you that this has been something very difficult at a nutrition level for us to tease out. And the main reason that it's been very difficult for us to tease out is that by providing a breakfast program that you're changing a lot of different things simultaneously that are not only nutrition. Um, school attendance goes up, um, more social engagement of the kids that are there. Um, and I mean, everybody is shaking your heads and you know that. And so at the end of the day, when administrators are trying to say, is this program effective, um, that you may be able to say, yes, our academic achievement has improved since we've, in we've implemented the program. But you can't say that it's the food part of it because you're benefiting across a whole bunch of different things. And the administrator will say, well, is there a le less expensive way I can do this? Um, um, you know, can I have soccer practice first thing in the morning instead and I'm going to see the same benefit. And so it's been very difficult to kind of really tease out and argue that it's been the nutrition piece of it that's there. Um, but I think as we're getting more and more data that is coming in, we're starting to get more and more improvement um, in terms of arguing that the breakfast piece of it probably uh, is beneficial. So um, this group of people um, this year, as they were looking across a whole bunch of different studies, were arguing that um, that while we still need to continue to study and we still need to substantiate it, um, that it looked as though um, providing breakfast to, uh, to children was beneficial, and particularly where they're talking about this lower postprandial glycemic uh, response, it's the same thing that I was talking about in terms of these low glycemic index carbohydrate foods, so that if you're providing breakfast programs, it's saying that, you know, kind of going on those more whole grain cereals, making certain that you're having the whole grain breads, um, that your carbohydrate sources are healthy ones, um, that that's going to be beneficial to the children. Um, and then this is just another one looking at a different set of data. And they were arguing that actually trying to make that, um, the more variety that you're bringing into the breakfast programs, the better it's going to be as well. Um, so as you're bringing them toast and cereal, make certain that there's some fruit um, and things like that on the table. Um, so we are increasingly getting evidence that the more food that we're actually supplying children before they're going into learning um, is going to be beneficial for them. It's not surprising that we know that the brain is using a lot of glucose and a lot of energy in order to be able to make those new synaptic connections that we so much want to achieve, and that by making certain that the brain has the fuel there um, is going to be supporting that particular process. And then we're also saying that the healthier you can make that breakfast for these kids, um, the more we're going to be moderating those adverse effects that we see in the context of, um, of obesity um, and that we're going to be helping with sort of some of those underlying inflammatory processes and the types of things that are happening in diabetes um, if we're providing more fruits and vegetables to the kids. Um, so I think the types of contextual information that we're getting as it relates to academic performance is actually fitting quite well with the metabolic understanding that we have in terms of how diet is impacting brain function.
So if we look in terms of um, hopefully what I've been able to communicate this morning is that I do believe that diet is an important contributor to brain health um, and that while it in and of itself um, doesn't contribute to neuroplasticity, what it does is it enables the environment to allow neuroplasticity to occur. Um, that we're not looking at the role of a single nutrient, that we are multiple nutrients that are needed in order to be able to maintain that healthy environment of the brain. And where that's so very important is saying, don't focus on pills and don't focus on superfoods. You've really got to be focusing on the global aspect of the, uh, of the diet because we also know that these nutrients are going to work together cooperatively with uh, with one another. Um, and then also saying that as we're making our focus, it shouldn't only be on diet, that we really need to be looking at um, the types of factors that support the neuroplasticity that we are trying to encourage in the brain, and that that's going to be things like physical activity, it's going to be things like social engagement, and we need to make certain that actually that the entire um, environment is correct. The sobering part in terms of the adverse environment of those obesity associated diseases is really um, very I think sobering to us but I think it's particularly uh, discouraging uh, or sobering maybe the better word in terms of individuals that do have the learning disabilities and the part of the reason that I'm saying that is that we know that self-esteem is often compromised in kids that have learning disabilities and that they're at increased likelihood to engage in what we call emotional overeating um, and so that the child with the learning disability is actually at higher risk in terms of developing the obesities than the child who doesn't have those learning disabilities. And so we're kind of starting to, um, you know, kind of add on top um, of these children sort of other things that may be negatively impacting their, uh, their brain function. And so looking at how we help the children not only in terms of not turning to food, in terms of um, uh, dealing with their issues in terms of insecurity, but also turning them towards more um, positive activities like physical activity in order to be able to um, develop that emotional health uh, is important. And I think we're going to be learning more about developing emotional health through um, other types of, uh, of meditative uh, and mindful activities in the children. Um, and I think we are at the point where we can talk in terms of trying to encourage um, the development or retention of breakfast programs, particularly if you're in areas uh, of low socioeconomic status in terms of the children where they're, uh, they may not be having optimal food. Um, so I realized that that was a, a mouthful. Um, and the, um, with that, I want to, uh, I'll, I'll say thank you. And then I'll just end by saying that um, I have, through the organization where I'm at, Baycrest, um, written a book that we call Mindful. And this is one where um, I've written the science, and then I've worked with individuals that are professional recipe developers, and they've effectively translated my science into food. Um, I delightfully see that it is one of the door prizes, um, the, uh, and I gather it is in the booths here today, and it's also uh, available online if anybody's interested. So thank you very much.